Thank you very much. So it's my great pleasure to um, um, uh, announce the last speaker of the of, of this morning session, that is John G from Gila, Nice, and the University of Colorado Boulder. He's going to tell us about his exciting work on clock, quantum matter, and fundamental physics. Thank you very much, John, Jun, for, for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Anna Maria. I presume you can see my slides, yes? Yes, yes everything's yeah. working. Well, thank you and Doug and Josephine for organizing this, bringing uh, the community together to KITP virtually. And I also want to thank Dave for such a fantastic talk and, uh, and of course, Mariana, that makes the, my job a little easier. I will focus a little bit on the neutral atom side of the clocks. One thing I want to add, you know, really emphasize, uh, I think um, Mariana said that during her talk is a really exciting time where the quantum science advances the, the precision measurement frontiers, which brings us this discovery potentials for fundamental physics. So if I may, uh, let's see. Yeah. I mean, let me start on this, uh, you know, building a clock, you emphasize on coherence, as Dave mentioned, use the coherence to advance precision and allow you to check all the systematics. And in the, right now, the community of quantum science and metrology are working together to to get entangled states into the picture of clock making as well. So, so all of this of uh, being able to do precise quantum state preparation, maintaining quantum coherence to optimum um, clock measurements and so on, allow us to advance the precision frontier. At the same time, of course, quantum science is getting a very exciting stage. People want to build a quantum computer, quantum information science, building systems with large scale quantum systems, entangled resources will be used. And that together, of course, is advancing the quantum science frontier. And you can see those frontiers are emerging and are creating opportunities for fundamental physics. And since we're talking about coherence, let me ask somebody ask that question about coherence. Let me just give you a very quick uh, sort of a animation of the time scale of the clocks we are talking about. The universe has the 10 to the 18 seconds of 15 billion years. A quantum pendulum such as what Dave talked about, single trapped ion, has, as you heard from him, in a quantum pendulum period, typically on this time scale of femtosecond, 10 to the minus 15 second, you take a geometrical mean of those two uh, extremes of time scales, you, lead, you arrive at this uh, time scale, which is quite sensible with human experience. In the case of uh, strontium atoms, we actually have a coherence time, uh, the atomic lifetime of 160 seconds in the, in the excited clock state, and we are pushing now quantum coherence to a matter of a minute at the moment in the laboratory. So, so this is getting to a point where, you know, you can think of a pendulum swing out of the entire lifetime has a quality factor of 10 to the 17. That happens to be the same quality factor that one second of the time elapsed in our human experience versus the entire age of the universe. And the clock being a connection of the space-time uh, fundamentally pro provide this new opportunities to probe whether it's existing physics but uh, with new capabilities or beyond standard model physics. And this is what Mariana talked about in, in her spirit uh, of, uh, of the seminar. What I'm going to tell you a little bit about, is it possible we can advance clocks to the level of say 10 to minus 21 and so on? where you can start to see the curvatures of space-time inference, the many-body entanglement. Can you build clocks to probe space-time ripples, such as gravitational waves? You know, we already heard talks about using clocks to put upper limits, and eventually by making clocks better and better at 10 minus 21, building a network of those, they <coughs> will be able to constrain the dark matter and maybe eventually discover the existence of dark matter through other than astrophysical observations. So, so I would say the clock really provides us a giant telescope, allow us to look into the universe, looking for gravitational waves, dark matter, but also provides a high re resolution microscope looking back on Earth and looking at all these geo uh, gravity effects and, and uh, rel relativistic geodesy and so on. So we have seen this summary of the clock advances over the time and optical clock has clearly surpassed the microwave based time standards and now by currently by two orders of magnitude. And it, you can 
think of all of these advances are we can thank uh, the technology development over the past two decades. And there are a number of them which made the enabling uh, breakthroughs. One is a high quality factor optical transitions. We heard from Dave on ions. I'm going to tell you about neutral atoms. New laser stabilization now allowing you to build optical coherence for many tens of seconds. We can put atoms, ultra cold atoms in optical lattices, engineering many body quantum states. There's optical frequency frequency comb that allows you to connect optical phase to the microwave phase and so on. And all of that contributed to the current clock uh, state of the art with measurement uncertainty at 10 to minus 18 level and the measurement precision now approaching beyond one part 10 to the 19. And, and I think that certainly it's very exciting that we, as we move towards 10 to minus 20, 10 to minus 21, beyond that, there will be a lot of opportunities coming out of these clocks. For, for fundamental physics. Just a, a quick slide about the current state of the art of stable lasers. These are built on silicon crystals and you, you cool these crystals down to a, a zero cross thermal, zero crossing temperature of the material. These, these cavities are exceedingly stable. In fact, we have been tracking these cavities for over three years now. Each, each day, it moves the frequency by two Hertz and we know exactly how much it moves uh, to a, with, a, with a residual uh, uncertainty at the level of few plus 10 to the 17 level. And if you beat two such independent cavities together, you can actually uh, reveal the coherence of these new stable lasers. So here shows a line width of 8 megahertz out of 150, uh, 1.5 micron wavelengths, sorry. So to just give you a scale of people mentioned about building networks in space, Lasers like this now can span a distance over hundreds and millions of kilometers, and it still maintains the phase coherence. In fact, Earth to the Sun, the distance is only eight minutes, and, and the, if the phase coherence time is exceeding a minute or approaching a minute, this is telling you an astronomical scale that you can maintain optical coherence. It can allow you to connect the two satellites and maintaining their uh, formation of the flying together. And Dave mentioned this key aspect of success of a single trapped ion clock, where they were able to, and, and this thanks to the many pioneers, he mentioned Dave Wineland as one of them. Uh, the, the, idea, the basic idea is that you can separate the internal degrees of freedom, those clock states, ground and excited state, and the external degrees of freedom where the motional degrees of freedom is quantized. And as you drive the transition from clock ground state to the excited state, the motion of degrees of freedom is well controlled. By doing that, you, you remove Doppler from the clock transition. You also remove the photon recoil effect. And you can, you can do, do that such that the trapping itself, the act, the very act of the trapping the particles is not influencing the frequency measurement you're making between the two clock states. And of course, in neutral atoms, we would like to expand this to multiple particles because the more quantum particles you use in your clock, the better the precision will improve by a square root of n number of particles you use. Yeah, and this is not even talking about quantum entanglement. If you can <coughs> implement entanglement or spin squeezing, then the improvement is goes further beyond the square root of the particle numbers. So, so this is a really, uh, the recent advance is by holding atoms in the so-called magic light ball, where the basic idea of using optical tweezers holding atoms in the in the trap formed by the optical beam itself is a simple. It's been uh, been here for a couple of decades, but typically an optical trap will result in a state dependent um, position dependent state uh, frequency shift. Uh, that that would so if the atom is actually trapped in the optical trap, the actual optical frequency of the clock transition is no longer accurate. But if you were able to find a particular wavelength of a particular species where the optical trapping potential can be engineered such that both the ground and the excited clock states experience the exact same uh, AC, so AC stock shift, they can essentially achieve the similar conditions as we have heard from trapped ions where the trapping potential for the motion, external motional degrees of freedom is then disentangled from the internal degrees of freedom where you're driving the clock transition. 
And once you achieve that particular trapping condition, it, it, the rest becomes relatively simple. You can have, a, in, in fact, you can have a single laser beam going, being reflected by a mirror that forms a standing wave in the so-called forming a one-dimensional optical lattice. And you can visualize this as a stack of pancakes where each one of those can have a dozen or so atoms trapped there. And that's the place where you can do uh, precision spectroscopy. To just tell you that, you know, the, the dramatic effect of confining these atoms in optical lattices. Let's start with atom in free space. And then we have cooled these atoms down to a temperature of just a few microkelvin. And yet you still have the Doppler broadening of your tens of kilohertz just because optical frequency is such a high, it is such a high value. But as soon as you put atoms into a shallow optical lattice that I discussed in the previous slide, you can immediately see that as you probe the Doppler transition of these atoms, the Doppler profile gets profoundly modified. And if you, the trap depth gets a little deeper and a, a little bit deeper, what you start to see is the, so, the development of so-called emotional sidebands, the language that we learned from trapped ion community. And the idea, of course, is very similar, where the emotional degrees of freedom along the trapping, the strongly confined direction is quantized. And you can drive the transition on so-called a carrier, where the, the, the harmonic emotional quantum state is not changing the quantum number. But you can also drive the so-called delta N equals to plus one sideband. This is called a blue sideband. And the, the separation between the carrier and the blue sideband equals exactly the trapped frequency of, of the atoms. They're confining these optical lattices with emotional degrees of freedom. And there's also on the blue side, band, on the red side, band, sorry, uh, you can also drive the emotional quantum number from uh, one to zero, for example, and this is called a minus one. But if the atoms are already um, cool to the emotional ground state, of course, then the such a red side band disappears. As you can see, there's a profound asymmetry between the blue and the red side band. I'm spending some time on this because later on, I'm going to come back to uh, the idea of how do we quantum state engineer these uh, these atoms in the, the motion of degrees of freedom. So so now you put these bunch of atoms in the individual pancakes as I visualized here, and you can uh, zoom into one of them. And as you start to drive the clock transitions, of course, their coherent state, uh, the light field is driving the spin pseudo spin half system, putting them from so called a block sphere from initially pointing to the south pole to the equatorial plane where you have a coherent superposition between down and the up states. And then these atoms are uh, left in dark state for a while where you watch how the clock um, is evolving, the, the, the individual spin is evolving with respect to the rotation frame of your laser. But if these atoms actually interact with each other, these atoms will be picked with the fermions and, and you have to therefore anti-symmetrize their wave functions. Nevertheless, if you have a long coherence times, even if the two atoms cannot have the so-called uh, the symmetrical emotional degrees of freedom interaction, the so-called S-wave interaction, you have to have odd partial waves or the odd uh, symmetrization of the spatial degrees of freedom because the spins are in the in a total, uh, total symmetrical state. In this case, this interaction is much weaker than if the particles were chosen as fermi uh, the bosons. But nevertheless, because the coherence time we're pushing is for multiple seconds, those very weak interactions still gives rise to uh, interaction shifts. In fact, we can actually see that those individual spins become entangled. The quantum fluctuation become correlated. And you can actually describe uh, a, a sort of a, uh, a system spin that uh, that has a, a base of Hamiltonians called a single axis twisting, where the SZ represents the collective spin degrees of freedom of all the atoms. And it, and it turns out by the correlating their spin degrees of freedom, you will have this quantum noise being twisted uh, as you as you probe the clock transition. So this gives rise on one hand, an interesting degrees of freedom to entangle these atoms. On the other hand, it gives rise to frequency shift unless you completely understand what's going on with this entanglement generation spin squeezing process, as well as loss in the in the process. So this led to two possible directions. So one is make really big 2D pancakes where interaction goes to zero. And I'm going to tell you some very recent result on, along this direction. Or you make a really tiny 3D cells 
where atoms are quantized to such a high level, where interactions are so large and they themselves become quantized, and therefore can be well accounted for in the clock transition. So let me first talk about this 3D uh, Fermi lattice clock. The basic idea is very simple, really. Uh, by cooling the atoms to very low temperatures and build optical lattice, not in one dimension, but in all three dimensions with the fermions, you hope they will be able to use party exclusion principle where one atom occupies one site that formed by the three-dimensional interference of, the, of these laser beams. And if you just do a, a, a daydreaming about scaling up the quantum system, you put a 100 by 100 by 100 optical lattices, you may put a one atom per site. If you have a coherence time of 160 seconds, you can actually reach a precision of a few plus 10 to the minus 20 at just the one second of averaging time. And this is a factor of 1,000 better than the current record that we hold at it one second. It was three times 10 minus 17. And the same similar ideas, of course, gives rise to uh, it, quite interesting with this is a very densely packed quantum material. And as you drive these things, there's a real interesting questions about Fermi Hubbard model. Uh, how do you deal with these relative energy scales of tunneling versus on-site interactions versus poly blocking, Fermi statistics, and so on. So it actually turns into a real interesting quantum simulation platform to understand some of the outstanding Hamiltonians in, in condensed matter physics. And yet we are turning this into a ex exquisite sensors for fundamental physics. And I also want to point out uh, this type of approach has now inspired this uh, follow-up work in optical tweezers. This particular pictures were taken by Adam Kaufman's group in Chile, where he was able to do both one-dimensional or two-dimensional optical tweezer arrays to push the uh, coherence time also in the strong, using strontium-88 bosonic systems to a few tens of seconds. Maybe I would um, skip to this slide. This is just talking about S using SUN to prepare single uh, Fermi C at a very, very fast uh, time scale so that we can have a single uh, single spin Fermi C uh, system with tens of thousands of atoms with, with temp Fermi temperature, with temperature of uh, over Fermi temperature of 0 0.07, indicating strongly or deeply degenerate quantum systems of a single spin, single nuclear spin quantum systems that we are ready to load these atoms into the three-dimensional optical lattice. And, and so, so this is the picture of ideally you want one atom per site. Uh, and if you do that, you, you do clock spectroscopy, you can now observe three sets of side bands that I mentioned on the motion of side bands earlier. Here you have three di different distinguished side bands because you have a three dimensional space and all three dimensions are quantized with the motional degrees of freedom. And there's no excitation on the, on the red side of the, on the spectrum. That's because the atoms are all cooled down to the motional ground state. If you're worrying about that we didn't do a clean enough job that atoms were left with multiple nuclear spins, as Strontium 87 forgot to mention, as a nuclear spin nine and a half. So when I mentioned earlier of do spin polarization to go into a single nuclear spin, that you can you can visualize this as you know one single color here. But if you are uh, the spin pur purification is not a is not a hundred percent complete, there are other atoms well, can be represented by different colored balls left in the system. Then in principle, these atoms do not have to obey poly expression principle because they are distinguishable. So you're putting these atoms in the optical lattice, they can cause frequency shift, as I mentioned earlier. <coughs> Fortunately, because they are, your confinement is so strong, the interactions with distinguished fermions are so strong that they are, in fact, separated from the main carrier, which that's why I call the quantized interactions. And it turns out, as long as you uh, anti-symmetrize the wave function between two particles, which can come from either the nuclear degrees of freedom or from the, the, the the electronic degrees of freedom, E and G represents ground and excited clock states. So the total wave function is always anti-symmetrized, but it, it can come from either nuclear or the electronic degrees of freedom. And that, that uh, manifested as two side bands, one blue, one side, one red side bands distributed along the carrier. But these side band has frequencies of a few kilohertz, while the carriers can be made as narrow as 
uh, tens of uh, millihertz. So they are far uh, offset from the actual clock transition and they no longer cause any frequency shifting effects uh, to the clock at the, ten, at the level of 10 to minus 21, 10 to minus 22 level. We can actually go beyond just having visualization of two atoms in one cell. We can actually have three, four, five atoms in these cells. And all of these interactions, that can, as you can tell, are quantized. And, and turns out you can have both symmetrized or anti-symmetrized wave functions with respect to the nuclear degrees of freedom gives rise to always two side bands corresponding to either two atoms per side, three atoms per side, four atoms per side, et cetera. And all of them are well separated from the optical carrier where as you are driving the clock transition, the interaction effects are no longer important in this case. And, and with so a single nuclear spin state, what we are working on right now is to create a so-called band insulator clock, where the clock are the, the lattice is occupied one atom per site. And then we have a clock laser that's driving the transition. The clock laser wavelength and the lattice wavelength is not necessarily equal just because of the wavelengths that we use to trap the atoms are given by this condition of reaching the so-called magical wavelength where the ground and excited state AC stop shift are matched. That wavelength is different from the clock laser that we probe the transition itself. So therefore, if you put atoms just naively between the lattice, uh, for, the, for the lattice sites that's formed by the lattice laser and, and then probed by the clock, the wavelengths are not necessarily, uh, the, the, you can see that between site to site, you can have a phase shift because the wavelengths, the K vector of the probe laser of the clock is not commensurate with, with the lattice spacing. And if the lattice is confined at a, at a much shallower depth because we're trying to remove any uh, Raman scattered uh, uh, process that's limiting the coherence time, that then the, the atom can actually tunnel. And because between the enabling sites, they pick up a different clock phase shift, they become distinguishable from myons. And so this process can actually lead to frequency shift. So we are working on ideas such that, such like, uh, you can make the wavelength of the clock laser, well, which that's fixed, but you can make the spacing of the optical lattice to be commensurate or to be in this picture showing basically equal to the wavelength of the clock laser itself. And as the atom jumping back and forth, you pick up no clock laser phase shift. In doing so, you maintain this strictly band insulator regime to allow you to reach very high coherence time. And that these are schemes that we're working on to, uh, to drive the three-dimensional optical lattice clock. You can also image, this is a technique we, we just, uh, we came up with, uh, you can combine high spectroscopy resolution and high spatial resolutions of a microscope together. And in this case, for example, this is a three-dimensional optical lattice, so we can apply a magnetic field gradient that gives rise to a frequency shift between lattice cell by cell. And you can use this imaging techniques to actually map out the frequency shift of the optical atoms, uh, of the, uh, these atoms in confining optical lattices. Here, the measurement position with the, uh, a few years ago with this three-dimensional optical lattice reached the low parts of 10 to minus 19 in a few hours. And the new measurement capabilities we are now advancing will allow you to reach this level in just a few 10 minutes. So this gives rise to this dream of this extreme space-time resolution. Is it possible, the fact that Earth is, you know, we are not talking about what Jake Taylor was talking about, gravitons, of course not. But we are talking about this curved space-time. If you can start to make a clock at the level of measurement precision of 10 to minus 21, you have these entangled states or many-body quantum states at a different layers uh, that uh, with respect to the elevation on, on top of the earth. And now you have to treat these many body entanglement and many body states under curved space time. That would be quite an interesting new regime of probing the connection between quantum physics and the gravitational physics. It's not a, it's not a quantum gravity, but it is a, 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 a allowing us to actually probe the curved space time quantum entanglement, which is new. With that, uh, the three-dimensional space uh, clock, it's still quite a, quite a year, quite a years away to be able to reach that level of precision. So we, 
we we thought about well let's take the other approach where you have one dimensional optical lattice and we're just going to make a really really large pancakes remember that there was two different strategies that we're going to take so this is a newly rebuilt java strontium one we actually had a java strontium one system is our workhorse system for the past 15 years this was the first system i built uh, when i became an assistant professor at the time uh, in the early 2000s and we just recently rebuilt that system to make the really large pancakes and and the, the key idea is to put a, a intro vacuum lattice uh, that's being supported by a cavity. Using cavity to build an optical lattice is not a new. Uh, a French group has done that. My group did that a few years ago. Andrew Ludlow's group did this uh, also. But th what's new is actually this cavity is really uh, inside the vacuum with very high finesse. And we because the finesse is so high, we uh, we designed the system such that the pancake is actually very large. Here shows almost half a millimeter as a as a as, as a diameter of these individual two dimensional pancakes. And and we were able to trap actually almost uh, atoms. This optical lattice is also extremely long, uh, vertically expands more than a millimeter. So that's a large system, in fact. Uh, and this here is just some. Uh, beautiful photos when we're putting that system together uh, near the end of uh, last year. So one, th one thing that we see immediately is that the traditional optical lattice clock that we, we have been working on this for many years oftentimes have these so-called blue and the red sideband that I explained earlier. As you cool the temperature down, you can see the red sideband disappears. It's still there a little bit. The blue supply sideband gets a little sharpened. And if people may work ask why the sidebands have the, such a line shape. And that's because in the transverse direction, the atoms are still hot. They are not fully quantized. And so there's a motional degrees of freedom that's coupling between the longitudinal direction, that's a strongly confined direction, and the transverse direction that gives rise to these the smeared out sidebands. The new system allow us to cool the system down much better. And you can actually see now individual motional states are all separated out. And in fact, if we cool down a little further, the red sideband went from the trace shown in red to blue, where they basically there's nothing uh, in the red sideband now. <coughs> and the blue sideband essentially comes down to that single motional degrees of freedom. And if you probe in the transverse direct dimension, the temperature has been lowered by a factor of 10, uh, it's typically now sitting at a few hundred, uh, 150 nanokelvin or so, uh, a, a temperature that's comparable to what we and do in the three-dimensional optical lattice with the Fermi system. And it's a really interesting uh, picture that we are now starting to operate the, these optical lattices because the atoms are so cold at a very, very shallow trapping depth. In this particular case, 15 E recoil trap depth. We typically use the energy scale or E recoil, that's a single photon recoil energy to describe how deep the lattice is. And typically we would be operating something which is a four or five times higher depth than this one. And then our recent work even pushing this down to 10 E recoil. In this case, we are seeing some really interesting because these atoms are, are scaled vertically. You will hear more about it, of course, in atom interferometer work um, tomorrow. But here you see this block side bands. These are the atoms that are moving back and forth due to the gravity in the optical lattice. And, and of course, individual pancakes are spaced apart with energy, with a gravitational potential energy of mgh. H is a, the separation between the pancakes, in this case, lambda over two, lambda is the optical wavelength forming the optical lattice. These, op, these block side events are exceedingly coherent. And in fact, in one experiment, we can use clock to measure gravitational potential, and we can use this optical block side bands to measure gravity. Uh, it's not yet, competitive with atom interferometers. But as we continue to push on this technology, it's actually quite interesting to think about the system that can measure both gravity and the gravitational potential in the single, single experiment. If we do, Anna Maria, I have like one or two minutes left, it seems like. Yes? Perfect, you. perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, Oh, you, you mute yourself. 
Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, didn't mean to. Uh, so this is the, I was going to say, this is actually the image of the lattice spectroscopy in the vertical direction. You know, the atoms, the lattice extends about a millimeter. And you can do these two different regions. You can image different regions. And you can look at, for example, the image, the top half versus the bottom half. And look at the coherence. This is very much in the same spirit what Dave talked about. In the, the same lasers driving these quantum coherence, and you can compare different regions, and you can see there's a strong correlations between the different regions. Yeah, it's effectively removing the laser noise, laser noise out of the picture. And if you if you do that, you can, for example, you can actually plot the the correlation between the top region versus the bottom region. And you can actually see extends this all the way out to 40 something seconds. You can still see coherence between the top and the bottom regions. Of course, in the end, we should be able to go all the way out to 160 seconds. That's what the coherence time should be given by the, the by the lifetime of the excited state. But there are some other mechanisms that's limiting us for the moment. But nevertheless, this is a really exciting to be able to push to this long coherence time with thousands of atoms at once. And the technique like this gives rise to actually in situ systematic evaluations across the entire sample. We used to just make one single measurement out of this ensemble average. But now you're looking into the guts of the clock. You can actually see pancake by, well, not quite pancake by pancake, but you can start to see pixel by pixel. What is the frequency shift? And you can cancel that. For example, this is a density shift as a function of the counting numbers. And you would know even in just one shot, you're starting to measure density shift at 10 to minus 18 level. And, and with this, just want to have one slide to tell you, well, this gives rise now a new capability of being able to measure 10 to the minus uh, 19 level of precision, one time 10 to minus 19 in less than one hour. And, and this is a really uh, exciting uh, time that we want to see actually gravitational redshift within this single optical lattice itself, that's a millimeter scale optical lattice will have a redshift across the sample of one part 10 to the minus 19. With that, I think I'm going to end here. Uh, I actually prepared some slides about fundamental physics, but but since Mariana and Dave already talked about this, I don't need to, uh, the, except the only difference I was going to tell you was this uh, cavity atom comparison provides allowing you to push the energy scale to the larger mass, you know, what Dave showed, that this allow you to push the corner up to the to the larger dark matter candidate mass. And still, and I think it will still have tons of room for improvement to continue to improve on this exclusion limit for the dark matter. I was going to tell you a few slides, few, few slides about the VUV comb for the nuclear clock transition, but since I ran out of time, I will end here. Uh, thanking many of the graduate students and postdocs, as well as many uh, collaborators from PDB, from NIST, uh, from Anna Maria, of course, Mariana, Michelle Lukin, Peter Zoller, and so on. Thank you for your attention. And thank you for the very, very nice talk. Uh, so now we are open for first some questions about the particular talk and then start a broad discussion of the last two or the overall the session this morning. So please just, um, you can raise your hand or just speak up yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is Jake, I have a short question. Go ahead, please. Jake. Uh, so June, you talked a little bit about uh, looking at the curvature of space-time. And I guess I just, well, I want to get a sense of, you know, how is it different than seeing <laughs> gravitational redshift? You know, what's, what's really the new physics that you hope to unveil? Thanks. Excellent, Jake. Um, yeah, actually, I think the difference really is at a, the, the many body level. If you have a single particle, and this is all nothing but redshift, uh, and it's being able to measure redshift at the level of millimeter, of course, is very exciting. Uh, uh, the, the, the DLD and so on, the folks that like that is very excited by that. But, but what's really interesting to me, I think, will be when you start to have, within that pancake, you, have, you, you build entanglement. And the link between pancake and a pancake and a pancake, they actually have a, they sit at different uh, gravitational red, redshift potential. So, so it would be interesting to allow you to have these pancakes to be tunneling back and forth. 
and watching how the how, how the entanglement survives during that kind of a curved space time. So that's different from single particle redshift. Thanks. Great. Um, more questions? Yep. Ariana, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I have a related question, actually. So in Jung's proposed experiment, uh, and th this is amazing work, and uh, um, it's very exciting to see this new uh, strontium-1 clock. How would it actually manifest itself? So you have your different pancake levels, and let's say you have entanglement in the system. And uh, so what do the signature would be in this case? Uh, uh, of uh, anything which is um, which you don't expect. I would say if you if you treated uh, you know suppose you do not assume there is if you do this experiment in international space station, you know away from the gravitational potential pole, they I would imagine the coherence time or the entanglement time is actually different from when the the curved space time is there. Yet in the end, if you understand if you treat the problem with the, the proper reference frame with a curved space time, probably there will be no surprise. Um, but if, if but are you experimentally probing this and uh, in terms of the actual signature, would it be well you can run your lattice clock horizontally where the individual pancakes will have no gravitational redshift versus vertically where you have the in, in, individual pancakes have gravitational redshift. If your measurement precision actually reached to the level where the block oscillation is occupying, you know, 10 sites or 100 sites or you know, over 100 microns. We are not quite there yet. We only reach like a millimeter at the moment. Then you will have, I would argue, if you just naively treat as a flat space time, those two systems will display a different entanglement uh, dynamics. Very interesting. If I, if I may uh, relate the question, but, uh... In the case of uh, sort of the next uh, experiment, when you can actually see perhaps the, just the, um, the shift due to difference in height between the you know parts of the pancake, can you directly compare the frequency in a different uh, uh, than pancake sites? Yeah, uh, that's actually what it, the, there was a plot I went through so fast I didn't didn't show. But there was a plot where I was averaging down to 10 to minus um, nine. Uh, well, basically just one times 10 to minus 10 to minus 19. That was not a single pancake. That was a, a collection of pancakes, about hundreds of pancakes versus at the bottom, at the top, versus hundreds of pancakes at the bottom. And we're just comparing those two regions. Mm -hmm. And, and it, that I think is starting to be really exciting. In fact, you can do that. You can also compare all these other, we actually, the first thing we did in the back uh, in January this year was we were able to characterize all the magnetic field gradient. We never were able to uh, just at the level of uh, 10 to minus 20 level. I, I showed a, a B square term, but, it, but I didn't really have time to go into it. But these are the effects that we can show that uh, at a high precision that gives you a more sort of a confidence of systematic uncertainty because we are seeing the entire neighborhood we're not just reporting a single number now, an ensemble average of single number, but rather exploring not only that single number, but also the gradient around it. Beautiful. And if I may, one last question. Yes, let me, let me come in one related to that, just Mariana, to something that we have been thinking in that direction. So June will have in his in his optical lattice different of M, M, the, the classical MGH difference, uh, but this in principle would accumulate a different phase. But in the presence, for example, of P wave or S wave interactions, there is going also to be a decoherence effect from these interactions. So the interesting part would be see if we can model this with the classical flat space and try to see the decoherence. How is this uh, decoherence will change, for example, if, uh, and if, for example, we need to really include curved space. I mean, if the gravity, I mean, we can do it with fixed gravitational potential G, but if something in my happening is that we have to have a G that varies from side to side. So would that be, be, I mean, this is a still classical and not quantum, but if you would really need to start to include corpus space that the G changes not, it's not constant through the Latin, but changes, that, that could be very, very exciting. Yeah, just a, a comment on that. Mm -hmm. Go, go that ahead. Is, that is very exciting. So, and the last uh, practical question, um, for the 3D, it takes a, 
uh, generally longer time to prepare as a lattice, so uh, the, that time would be longer. So what about this new strontium, <clears throat> strontium one clock with uh, such a large lattice? What's at that time would be if you have this one ensemble? At that time right now is, um, yes. So what I spoke about is this coherent spectroscopy, and which is what Dave also talked about, that you try to look at the correlation between the top and the bottom region. So you can sort of remove the laser noise out of that picture. But if you use this whole entire system to compare, suppose I build two of those and I start to compare them, then this actually goes to what Dave showed again, the, the, this border clock network where you have the clock laser would be part of the noise process. And, and it's, so the, the duty, uh, duty cycle is what limit, limit us. Duty cycle is essentially how long you need to prepare mm -hmm. the quantum samples. There are different techniques out there. You can, of course, in one vacuum chamber, you can prepare two such quantum samples so that you, you can alternate when you're using sample A, the sample B is being prepared. You go to sample B when sample A is being prepared. So, so there's just new quantum resources you can, you can assign to the system to remove the dead time. Andrew, Andrew Ledelow had done some of that work already. Um, <coughs> the current, the dead time we have is about, um, one second in preparing the entire samples. But now as we push the coherence time to 10 seconds or longer, mm -hmm. that time becomes a less, less of a problem, but it's still there. In, in fact, any time you stop the, the laser evolution, that introduces the dead time because the phase is being disrupted. Um, so, so that's something that you know, eventually I, I do think that that time doesn't have to be a problem. Um, it, it, it is a technical problem, practical problem, or one can find practical solutions for it. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Mariana. So I, I see, um, Igor, there is a, a comment that you wanted to make. I see it in the chat, but I don't know if, if, if there was supposed to be a, a, a for discussion or maybe. Well, it will always be great to hear Igor's uh, discussion point. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if he's muted or... Okay, uh, uh, well, we can, we can continue tomorrow in principle. That's the idea why we have different days of, of discussion. So, um, but I mean, still we have more uh, time for 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 a vote or, I mean, to discuss all the talks in the morning if, if we want. Uh, I'll wait, uh, two party, uh, sorry, go ahead and please, I see two, uh, two people with hands raised, please just start speaking, please. I, I have a question about, um, I mean, one of the issues in uh, precision gravitational physics is there's been, a, I mean, differences in the measurements of, of Newton's constant. Um, is there any prospect that anab interferon, I mean, uh, trapped uh, ions and, and so on can, improve that. Of course, you'd need to be sensitive to gravitational fields produced not by the Earth, but by some piece of matter that you could weigh separately. So I, I'm not personally aware of any proposals using trapped ions for making a big G measurement, um, but that could just be my own ignorance. I, I, I can say I thought about it. <laughs> no, um, but it is very daunting. I, I think too small. you, you uh -huh. yeah, too small. You know, yeah. that's why Earth is still irreplaceable. Yeah. Earth's gravitational field is great. You know, if you yeah. if you get the entire Earth concentrated in a ball, <laughs> that, uh, and you know, not Rocky Mountain kind of size, and you put yeah. your clock nearby, and your clock can reach 10 to minus 23. Actually, I think I made those estimates a while ago. You can get to the Competitive, competitive numbers of what people are doing with torsion balance and so on. And, and I know this big G continue to be a problem that bothers us, right? It's because the gravitational interaction is so weak. And that's why that's one number, the precision measurement metrology has not made advance for a long time. Thank you. Uh, there is a question about, I would like to know about what is the limiting factor for the new strontium clock in GILA to reach 10 to the minus 20? What is the limiting factor? So for measurement precision, I think we are there. Uh, we will be able to 
report these numbers in the coming month. For, for the systematic uncertainties, we of course need to, to characterize. And the, the remaining thing is really the, tech, the BDR that we need to characterize, the, the black body radiation. But now we actually sort of have a thermometer now that's uh, ex uh, spatially extended. We can actually see how homogeneous of the system is and, and so on. At the moment, we actually con took an approach of spatially control every single part of the, the vessel of the vacuum chamber so that we're trying to make it a homogeneously uh, thermal, a thermal environment as homogeneous as possible. Um, our goal is to, uh, to show the accuracy at the level of low 10 minus 19 for this mm -hmm. call. But in principle, in principle, doing dipole dipole interactions and Kotnaki interactions and all of them can start. That is very exciting too. That's an excellent question. And in fact, the dipole dipole interaction, because we made the sample relatively dilute, and this is the, what the two approaches in 3D lattice, we'll continue to explore dipolar interactions with you. But in the 1D system, because the system, you know, we're basically relying on building a really large system, but the density is low in comparison to the 3D optical lattice clock. So the dipolar effect is likely to be very small. The effect you were talking about that we earlier when we were talking with Mariana about spin orbital coupling, you know, when we did that work together a few years ago when the lattice is horizontal, you can actually look at the S wave, P wave interactions as atom fermions are tunneling back and forth. And here you will see that effect as well. This is actually part of Jake's question earlier about what's so interesting about, you know, redshift. But you would actually have to study those spin orbital couplings with the redshift in, in mind. That I think is really interesting because I would love to have a systematic effect of that order <laughs> to be limiting us. But at the moment, I think that we are, we are going for low density. So, so I showed a map where density shift per count is being ma measured out just by looking at the entire map out of the CCD camera. And, and that density effect that we are pretty certain we can characterize below 10 minus 19 level. Great, um, excellent. Is there any more questions? Uh, Anupan, you are raising your hand. Uh, and Ted, um, go yeah, ahead. Uh, thanks, thank you very much. Uh, so yes, uh, so uh, June, very nice talk. I really enjoyed uh, David and June's both talk. So, um, just to answer Lance's question, so I was just wondering that uh, since you could take, uh, you, John, you mentioned that uh, you can create a superposition with the clock. And if these clocks have certain masses and if you can put them very close, perhaps one can measure the, even uh, the Newton's constant. Of course, the problem will be that, uh, you know, uh, the gra gravity gradient noise because, uh, uh, you know, this is always present. So maybe one would have to drop it in a drop tower or something in a, Maybe in, on Earth one can do it. Uh, maybe in a Grand Sasso laboratory, or maybe in Fermi lab. If I just go underground, where because I can get rid of the seismic noise and things like that. Maybe there's possibility one can perhaps try this kind of experiments. Well, the, thanks for asking that. I think of putting two atoms together, the mass is just too tiny. To, uh, to, so the only way to do it is one of the partners got to be massive. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, not the, not with the atoms. You need some massive part. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. And so you can, you know, people actually tomorrow we will hear really wonderful talks because there are pioneers in this field that's going to talk tomorrow who use atom interferometers that you can actually measure, uh, you know, big G. And there again is using Earth as your experimental field. Um, that entire Earth mass is providing the gravitational potential, and you can actually looking at this. The, you know, interference of atom interferometer to allow you to constrain or measure, actually, in fact, big G. But again, there are lots of the systematics. This is the one new approach on big G. And there are some disagreement with, with the existing uh, more classical torsion balance or other techniques that, that's out there. We'll see if the atom interferometer will continue to advance the state of the art. For clocks, I think it's very challenging. Right. I, I have a okay. short comment, it's just uh, along that point. So uh, one, remember from my talk, I, I discussed this fine structure constant for gravity. So the idea that we can use the sort of quantum related measurement techniques for measuring big G is, is really 
challenging because the equivalent thing we did with electromagnetism really relied on the final structure constant not being so small. So uh, when we talk about systematics, what we're saying is we have to have some really large mass, and we have to know it's where what the mass is, so inertial value, which we can do, but also we need to know its density and distribution. And that's turned out to be a huge systematic that we don't have a great way to solve. So if we can solve that, then the other techniques really start to go and become important. But without that very prosaic, where's the stuff inside the sphere? <laughs> It turns out that it's really hard to get those X doubles of. I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, so, but in principle, I'm talking about technology, let's say from 30 years from now, 50 years from now. Maybe I can think about take a diamond, embed uh, ether BM, which is June was talking about, which has a coherence lifetime very long. I can map it to nuclear spin, make it even longer minutes, uh, perhaps. And then maybe I can do this kind of experiment. Of course, uh, mm -hmm. having said so. You got, you got, you have 43 orders of magnitude to beat. <laughs> so good luck, but it's, you know, maybe it's possible. I don't you know. have to dream, you have to dream big. Of course, it's extremely, extremely hard problem. So we have to really push hard, but it is a possibility. And this is what I'm saying. No, actually, so Jake, if you can, if you can get the clock to 10 to minus 24, and I remember those estimates, and you have the osmium, I think that's the heaviest element uh, that we can get our hands on. You make an osmium that's a meter in the sphere, and uh, make it a very, like Jake said, it's actually really important. You make, that's why the PTB invested so much on spherical uh, sphere of uh, silicon. They really need to know what uh, the, you know the crystal, where the mass is distributed. If you can make osmium sphere near your clock, and you move in and out at 10 minus 24, you will be able to see it. Uh, you will see gra gravitational uh, g. But again, you know, if by barely seeing it, to actually make a very high precision measurement. It's it's not going to be competitive yet in the next 20 years, I think. Great, perfect. The gravitational thing is just damn weak, right? I thought I saw a hand from Ted, but I don't know if any more. Ted, you have a question or do you want to? Uh, yeah, I do. In terms of um, the limit, the clock comparison limits, on time variation of constants and you know commensurate commensurate uh, clocks and different elements. I'm just wondering, have people looked at? Is it possible to look for variations with the uh, motion of the Earth or the diurnal variations? Um, I mean, I guess you would need enough stability and enough data collection to have a significant, a meaningful search for signals at a certain periodicity. But I just wonder if that's even no, is that possible now, or when might it be possible to look and for such signals? Comment on that. So that that is possible now. That's one of the kinds of measurements that uh, we've been able to do with clocks. And you know, the thing that makes that um, doable with clocks is that we have such good understanding and control of systematic effects that we can. Uh, be confident that over the span of, you know, days, weeks, months, and years, that there aren't, there are unwanted noise terms showing up in the clock frequency, so we can look for these fundamental effects, like you're talking about, as the Earth rotates or as the Earth uh, moves around the sun. Um, and that, that's been used for tests of, you know, local position invariance and I also showed a slide where they've um, done a competitive, in, in fact, uh, uh, leading uh, constraint on Lorentz invariance using clocks. Go ahead, Maria. Do you have a comment on that? Or yes, I, I just gonna have a comment. So this Uterbium Plus paper that uh, was six months of data. So for the Lorentz invariance variation, as there is no reason why it cannot be done uh, more. And they actually had very frequent measurements for comparing two turbine plus clocks. So that was specifically the Lorentz invariance uh, uh, look for the uh, daily variation and also for the um, variation with Earth going around the sun uh, to be able to get the C uh, coefficients, Lorentz violating coefficients. So this is exactly the type of experiments. Uh, which you're asking about. Thank you. Maria, 
Can I um, also add a comment, quick comment? I was actually share a slide that Marianne actually showed. Uh, this was a, you know, what Dave was saying that you, know, you, you have these clocks, you can build a network, you can actually look for, keep a record for a long time. This was a measurement record that was a long time ago, uh, back in 2005, the, the first data point is actually the first strontium clock measurement we made in Chile. That, um, and you can see there's a sort of across three co different continents, Europe, Asia, and the, and, the, and the US, North America. We kept the clock comparison for over two years. And so there's two side real period as Earth is running around the sun. The problem is the time is the only way we can compare is through the GPS because these clocks are located very far. And the only way we can connect is through cesium because that's a common, common infrastructure. To this day, sadly, we still do not have intercontinental connections on optical clocks. So what Dave talked about, the border area network is all within border. And Europe has a European uh, network. Uh, hopefully soon, we, you know, putting, that's another high urgency is putting satellites is where we can actually connect these different continents and make these type of clock comparisons at 10 to minus 18 and beyond level. Excellent.